I know. And those people who are watching who have class with me have watched me fumble with this before and know that I can't see anything without my glasses. And as soon as my glasses are on, everything <laughs> fogs up, right, Maggie? Maggie has watched me fumble with this new class every time. So um, good. I think we have everything um, set up and we are ready to go. This is kind of, Maggie, this is kind of interesting. It's kind of like being in class where I am speaking to a small group and knowing that there are actually more people zooming in that are in the, in the room. So, um, and uh, uh, anyway, I'm so glad to see you here and those of you um, zooming in. I want to welcome you to the James Fleming and Linda McLean Constitution Day Lecture at the University of Missouri. And this year's event recognizes the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which was an event that certainly did not end the struggle for voting rights, but was nonetheless an essential and significant part of that story. The lecture this year is a partnership between um, the history department, of which I am chair. I'm Catherine Rimp, chair of the history department. It's a partnership between the history department, the Kinder Institute on Constitutional Democracy, and the local chapter of the League of Women Voters. And I want to say just a little bit about the Kinder Institute, which is a joint venture between historians and political scientists at the MU campus. It has a very meaty lecture series, normally on Friday afternoons, that is continuing this year on Zoom. Um, and so if you're interested in that programming, you can find that at democracy.missouri.edu. And the local League of Women Voters, um, the Columbia Boone County League, has been commemorating its own centennial through 2019. Um, and as part of those efforts, the League of Women Voters delved into its own local history and put together an exhibit at the Boone County Historical Society that documents the local history of the suffrage movement here in Columbia, Boone County, the University of Missouri. And they put together a virtual tour of that exhibit, which you can access from their homepage, which is LWVCBC, so League of Women Voters, Columbia, Boone County, .org. And this evening, we are very fortunate to have with us one of the country's leading experts on women's suffrage and on women's political history. Marjorie Spruill is Professor Emeritus at the University of South Carolina, and she's the author of numerous books on women's history and women's suffrage. She is the editor of, well, you can see it up there. I brought my own very kind of dog-eared copy that has pages falling out of it. Um, one Woman, One Vote, Rediscovering the Women's Suffrage Movement. And that book pulled together some of the newest approaches to the history of women's suffrage when it was published in 1995, which was the 75th anniversary of um, the 19th Amendment. At the time, it featured writings of some of the leading women's historians um, and also up and coming scholars. I am still using some of the essays from that book in my class this semester. Um, one Woman, One Vote was the companion volume to the 1995 documentary of the same name. That has been a staple in many US history courses. And indeed, if you watch that documentary, you can see a 1995 version of Professor Spruill because <laughs> he's one of the featured um, experts uh, in that documentary. And I'm happy to tell you that a new edition of that book is coming out in January, and she'll probably say something about that. Professor Spruill has been on several editorial boards. She's been the recipient of prestigious fellowships, including from the National Endowment for Humanities and the Woodrow Wilson Center. Her most recent monograph, Divided We Stand, the battle over women's rights and family values that polarized American politics. That book took her into the late 20th century and to the struggles over feminism in the 1970s that culminated in the drama of the National Women's Conference that was held in Houston in 1977. And that story, if you don't know that story already, it is a very um, 
very compelling one with many colorful characters, some of whom you would have heard of before, many of whom you would not have probably. And it's a really important book because it just shows um, so clearly how the contentious debates over women's rights and the family have contributed to political realignment and have reshaped American politics in the decades um, since that conference in the late 70s. On a more personal note, I want to say that Professor Spruill is a generous scholar who's been very supportive of me and of my own work. I know that if she had been able to come to campus, which is, of course, what we originally planned, um, she would have taken time to meet with students and with um, faculty in addition to giving her talk tonight. So we are not able to have her with us here in person, but we persevere. And I would remind you, if you don't know this already, that the battle for suffrage itself was impacted by a pandemic, that is the flu of 1918. And the flu hit in 1918 when suffragists were in the throes of campaigning for additional state referenda and um, lobbying Congress. And they had to contend with uh, travel restrictions and bans on large gatherings, which is very hard when you're conducting a political campaign, as we know. But those suffragists found means to carry on, and we do as well tonight. Um, and so with that, I present to you Marjorie Spruill. All right. Well, thank you very much, University of Missouri, for this invitation to address you tonight. And Catherine Rimp, a scholar whose work has helped me greatly and whom I much admire. Uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I would love to be there with you and see uh, students and faculty members I know and to talk and talk and talk about all the ideas that we all care about. I am very honored to deliver the Kinder Institute's annual James E. Fleming and Linda C. McLean Constitution Day Lecture. Uh, I will be speaking to you, as Dr. Rimp said, about the long road to ratification of the 19th Amendment. It is, of course, part of our year-long celebration of the 100th anniversary of this amendment being added to the United States Constitution. This lecture as she said, is based on my book, One Woman, One Vote. Uh, and I will have, it, it, it's still available uh, in print and available on Amazon and elsewhere. And an updated, expanded version is going to come out in January. And um, the book, the lecture is about how and why this amendment was adopted and about why it took so long. The lecture is a bit long, I warn you, so I'll try to move along quickly and make it lively, and we'll look forward to your questions at the end. On August 26, 1920, which we now celebrate as Women's Equality Day, Secretary of State Bainbridge Colbury signed a proclamation officially declaring the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and it declared that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This victory was dearly won and long in coming. Between 1848, when reformers gathered at a convention in Seneca Falls, New York, first endorsed a woman's suffrage resolution, and 1920, when state legislators gathered in Nashville, Tennessee, ratified the amendment by just one vote, generations of suffragists labored tirelessly for this cause. As suffragists rejoiced that day, they recall the sacrifices of their foremothers and the many thousands of women who had been a part of what National President Carrie Chapman Catt called, quote, this continuous, seemingly endless chain of activity, unquote. Old suffragists who forged the first links were dead when it ended, she wrote, while young suffragists who helped forge the last links of that chain were not born when it began. So why this long, arduous struggle? Framing the Constitution, women were not explicitly excluded 
the issue of who was allowed to vote was left to each state. But everywhere in the Young Republic, the vote was restricted to property owners on the theory that only they could exercise independent judgment. That automatically excluded married women, since state laws generally followed a concept borrowed from British common law in which a married woman's legal identity was covered by that of her husband. But widows and unmarried women with property were also excluded. The only exception was New Jersey, which for three decades permitted all inhabitants who met property requirements to vote, including women. Women, most people assumed, had no independent interests beyond the interests of their families, which were represented in politics by male heads of household. And in addition, most people considered women to be unsuitable as voters, too irrational and emotional, and in the early 19th century, people increasingly spoke of women as better than men in terms of morality and religiosity, but yet they insisted that women could inspire and influence male voters for good without being exposed to and endangered by the corrupt world of politics. Even as states began to loosen restrictions on voting to allow all white men, including those without property, to qualify, Early advocates of women's suffrage found that ideas about gender and politics, as well as laws stipulating qualifications for voting, were all extremely resistant to change. Over time, through tremendous work and despite many defeats, suffragists would manage to persuade some states to enfranchise women. But some states, particularly in the South, as you see in this map, remained unwavering in their opposition. Therefore, full enfranchisement of American women would ultimately depend on securing an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And as we know, amending the Constitution was difficult, and it was difficult by design. Though the Founding Fathers intended for it to be a flexible document, they also wanted to forestall any kind of faddish changes, ones that lacked broad national support. And as you know, to succeed, an amendment had to have the approval of two thirds of each House of Congress and then three fourths of the states. It followed, therefore, that no reform that's regarded as radical by most Americans at a given moment could be added to the nation's founding document. And also that any proposed amendment that failed to gain at least some support in every part of the nation was destined to fail. And thus the story of how women won the vote in the United States of America is long and complicated, though of course laid out clearly in the essays in One Woman, One Vote. The woman's suffrage story is a tale of hard work and ingenuity of strategic adaption to cope with changing circumstances. It's a story of regional, racial, and generational tensions, of struggles between ideals and political realities, and of sheer perseverance. It includes inspiring stories of harmony and cooperation between diverse groups of suffragists and a disturbing record of discrimination and betrayal. It is a story of reformers failing time after time as they had to plead with men for rights they believed were already theirs and nonetheless persisting. Finally, the woman's suffrage movement is integrally related to the nature of the amendment process in the United States and a very appropriate for us to be looking at on Constitution Day. At its core is a story about how a movement begun in one section of the nation by a small group of women considered to be radicals somehow managed to gain the strong widespread support required to overcome the obstacles deliberately placed in its path. So how did it begin? The woman's suffrage movement originated in the northeastern part of the United States in the context of antebellum reform. Many women began speaking out for women's rights when their own efforts to participate fully in the great reform movements of the day, most notably the movement to end slavery, 
were severely criticized as inappropriate for their sex. Agitation for women's rights preceded the establishment of a woman's suffrage movement by several years. Among the earliest to raise the issue were the Grinke sisters of Charleston, South Carolina, Angelina and Sarah, women from a prominent slaveholding family, but left their privileged existence to live among Quakers in the North because of their opposition to slavery. And they were traveling as agents of anti-slavery organizations and speaking out, including in public and before men. The women who set the women's rights movement in action by calling the Seneca Falls Convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott, also ran into difficulties participating in the anti-slavery movement. They first met in London where they had gone for the World Anti-Slavery Convention, only to find that women were excluded from the, from the proceedings and told to sit behind a curtain. In 1848, they organized the now iconic gathering in Seneca Falls, New York, where participants adopted a Declaration of Sentiments, demanding a wide range of reforms. Suffrage was but one of many issues discussed, and it was considered so controversial that only powerful urging by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and the formerly enslaved famous anti-slavery orator Frederick Douglass convinced them to include it. Many refused to sign. In fact, Stanton's husband, Henry, who had political aspirations, actually left town during the conference so he could retain some degree of deniability. Other white women who became prominent leaders of the antebellum era included Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and Antoinette Brown Blackwell, who were not at Seneca Falls, but quickly became involved. As the women's movement took off in the 1850s, it was an interracial movement. Most of the African-American women active in the women's movement in these years were middle-class women who had been born free, including Sarah Remond, an abolitionist from a prominent African-American family in Salem, Massachusetts, and Harriet Fortin Purvis and her sister Margaretta Fortin, co-founders with Lucretia Maud of the Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, which the Grimkes also joined. The Fortins helped organize the first National Women's Rights Convention in 1854. Sojourner Truth was also active at this early stage of the movement. Born into slavery in New York from which she escaped, Truth was illiterate but eloquent, an advocate for the rights of women and African Americans, and became one of the most famous reformers of the 19th century. I'm pleased to show you a brand new statue of Sojourner Truth together with fellow New Yorkers, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony that was just dedicated a few weeks ago on August the 26th, 2020 in Central Park. And I'm amazed to say this was the first statue of an actual woman or women as opposed to allegorical or historical characters like Alice in Wonderland to ever be in the park. Early women's rights movement, however, was clearly a regional movement. In the decade before the Civil War, women's rights advocates held annual conventions throughout the North and the Midwest, but in the South, whites disdained the movement as a spinoff of the anti-slavery movement, and the Grimkes were warned never to return to the South. Now, during the Civil War, the women's rights movements chose to put aside advocacy of their own rights and to work exclusively for the freedom of the enslaved. With Stanton and Anthony in the lead, they organized the Women's National Loyal League that gathered over 400,000 signatures calling on Congress and President Lincoln to make this a war of liberation. In other words, they helped create the political climate that made the 13th Amendment to the Constitution possible. When the war ended, women's rights advocates began to focus more and more on gaining the vote. And but not just for themselves. Women and men who had worked together to end slavery were now formed an American Equal Rights Association with the goal of securing equal rights to all American citizens, especially the right of suffrage, irrespective of race, color, or sex, and I quote. But the unity within this old community of reformers was strained when some of their 
old allies began to insist that in the words of Wendell Phillips, there can only be, quote, one reform at a time, and this hour belongs to the Negro, unquote. He urged women not even to campaign for women's suffrage, but concentrate on enfranchisement of the freedmen. As Faye Dudden has told us in her excellent book, he also withheld money that was donated by a philanthropist who had intended that once slavery was ended, that the money should go to promote woman suffrage. It was at this point that, urged to delay advocacy of woman suffrage for a generation, Anthony allegedly made this much quoted statement that she would rather cut off her right hand than to ask for the ballot for the black man and not for woman. Sojourner Truth was also upset at Phillips' insistence that this was the Negro's hour. In fact, reminding the American Equal Rights Association that the Negro also included women like her and saying, quote, there is a great stir about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about the colored women. And if colored men get their rights and not colored women, there, as you see, the colored men will be the masters of the women. It will be just as bad as before. So I am for keeping the thing going while things are stirring, she said. But the Republicans in control of Congress went forward with their plans and pushed through constitutional amendments, the 14th and 15th, to protect the rights of the newly freed African Americans, which so desperately needed them. But in them, in these amendments, the voting rights, of course, would be extended only to men and no women. In fact, the second clause of the 14th Amendment, which is the enforcement clause, may, is what made it clear that the amendment's protection of voting rights would apply only to male citizens. And in fact, inserting the word male in the US Constitution for the first time ever. Even Frederick Douglass, a lifelong advocate of women's rights and heretofore a staunch ally, joined with Phillips, insisting that as the South was passing new laws that virtually re-enslaved African-Americans, that they must have the vote to protect themselves and they could not run the risk of including women's suffrage. Republicans in Congress also realized that in France and franchising former slaves in the South had practical applications as well as idealistic, that it would give their party a base of support in the South. Uh, and it would mean that now that the war was over, that they would be able to continue to control Congress and the presidency, which meant they'd be able to continue their goal of reconstructing the South. They insisted that with racial prejudice strong in the North and the West, as well as the South, it was going to be hard enough to get the requisite number of states, three-fourths, to extend the vote to black men. Most of the Republican congressmen concluded adding woman suffrage would make that impossible. <clears throat> Frederick Douglass begged woman suffrage advocates to understand that this was the Negro's hour and said the woman's hour would later come. The issue of what to do in this situation tore the women's movement apart. In 1869, the movement divided into two factions over whether or not to support ratification of the 15th Amendment and how to go about winning the vote for women. Two separate women's suffrage organizations were established in 1869. One, the National Women's Suffrage Association, based in New York, headed by Stanton and Anthony, actively opposed the 15th Amendment. As the amendment went forward, they demanded an additional federal amendment in franchising women, an amendment they hoped would be the 16th. The NWSA was determined that like black men, women would also be given the vote soon and by federal action. They adopted a, a relatively militant uh, tone. The other organization was the American Women's Suffrage Association, based in Boston and led by Lucy Stone. Stone was equally dismayed at being left out, but supported the 15th Amendment anyway. For that reason, not surprisingly, 
more African American suffragists sided with the AWSA, though some with the NWSA, and Sojourner Truth attended the conferences of both organizations. Now, to be clear, the AWSA also favored a federal amendment for women's suffrage, but recognizing that its chances were then slim, they set out to cultivate grassroots support. Their strategy, persuasion, to demand to persuade the public that women's suffrage wasn't a radical proposal, but one that was consistent with widely shared American values. The AWSA formed state level organizations and sought to educate the public in all the states on the suffrage issue and to win state suffrage amendments or any kind of partial suffrage, anything to advance the cause. Benton and Anthony at the National, however, could not bear, they said, the idea of going all over the United States, begging men for rights that they thought should already be theirs as citizens. And in this period of bitter disappointment, they both made statements denouncing the idea that women like them, educated, respectable, politically savvy, would be governed by former slaves in addition to the newly arrived immigrant men whom they spoke of as illiterate, ignorant, degraded, and possibly violent. These statements have received a great deal of attention during this centennial, one in which we are rightly giving a close look at racial issues and racist aspects of the movement, as well as recognizing the contributions of women of color. People are understandably horrified that two of the most famous leaders of the movement made statements like this and it's led some to criticize celebrating the centennial at all. My view is that the centennial is an opportunity to focus attention upon and learn about all these things and come to a better understanding of the woman's suffrage movement in its entirety and in the context of its times and in relation to this ever-changing historical circumstances in the movement's long history. In the early 1870s, the movement entered a new stage in which the national had a new approach, the new departure, claiming that as citizens, they already had that right. And all over the Northeast, women, including Sojourner Truth, attempted to register and vote, though most were turned away. Some, including Anthony, intended to test this concept in the federal courts, mm -hmm. vote illegally to be arrested and tried and defend herself by insisting that the newly adopted 14th Amendment actually protected voting rights of all citizens, including women. In 1872, Anthony managed to persuade a sympathetic registrar to allow her to cast a ballot. She was then arrested and indicted for, quote, knowingly, wrongfully, and unlawfully voting for a representative to the Congress of the United States, unquote. It's a fascinating case to study. And those of you who are interested in the law should go for it. Don't have time to go into it, but just say this. It began with the judge arriving with his decision already written out in his hand. And it was a trial with male judge, attorneys, and jurors, and that lone female defendant. To Anthony's great disappointment, her case did not make it all the way to the Supreme Court. Something happened about her lawyer paying her fine uh, without her permission, uh, and she was furious. And by the way, would have had choice words, I believe, for the current occupant of the White House who recently pardoned her for something she didn't think was wrong. Another case that should be of great local interest in a suffragist Virginia Minor of St. Louis, Missouri, succeeded in getting the issue before the Supreme Court in 1874 in a civil suit. Minor and her lawyer husband, Francis Minor, who actually made the suit because as a woman, she didn't have the standing to make a suit. Both of them were ardent suffragists and they, they sued after the local registrar named Happerset refused to allow her to register and vote. However, in a very important uh, decision, the court ruled unanimously that citizenship did not automatically confer the right to vote and that the 14th Amendment did not prevent any state from excluding women. That meant that for women 
there would be no quick federal solution, that the issue was going to have to be decided by each state. And of course, ultimately, they would get the federal amendment. Now, in 1874, this was a major setback, a major blow. Later, after the 1920 victory, the suffragists added it all up, and they found that between this point and the victory for the 19th Amendment, that they had been forced to conduct all these, as you see on the screen, all these campaigns and referenda, campaigns to urge legislators to submit suffrage to voters, campaigns for state constitutional conventions, campaigns to persuade state party conventions to support women's suffrage, campaigns for presidential party conventions to adopt suffrage, 19 campaigns with 19 successive Congresses, that there would be no immediate rescue through federal action, and that women must take on this hard work of persuading men in each state to grant them the vote was a daunting process. But there were some signs that suggest success was possible, and they came from this very unexpected source, the Wild and Woolly West. Everyone's surprised, politicians in several Western states not only enfranchised women, but at times actually fought Congress for the right to do so. In 1869, Wyoming, still a territory, led the nation in the adoption of women's suffrage when the leading men of the territory, inspired by this tough pioneer woman whose statue is in Statuary Hall as well as in Wyoming, she, Esther Morris, she had attended those pre-war suffrage conventions back east, um, and they enfranchised Wyoming women. Even more surprising was that the Mormon stronghold, the territory of Utah, was also among the first parts of the United States to grant women suffrage in 1870. And here is the Mormon president of the Utah Territory Woman Suffrage Association, herself a plural wife, Emmeline Wells. Colorado in 1893 and Idaho 1896 were the other pioneering suffrage states. The women from these states organized into the Rocky Mountain Woman Suffrage Association, you see posing here with Anthony, were justly proud of their region. Remember that at this time, this was the only place in the world where women could vote. Historians differ as to the reason the West was so precocious in its adoption of the woman suffrage, but most stress practical politics. In each case, politicians found it expedient, beneficial to enfranchise women, and for different reasons. In Wyoming, the leading men of this sparsely populated territory thought that enfranchising women would attract national attention, that it would be an effective marketing gimmick, and that it would attract new residents, perhaps women back east where the massive Civil War casualties led to a skewed gender ratio. There were lots of other reasons involved. It's very complicated and it's all laid out in the book. Anthony was delighted, urged women to go to what she called this land of liberty. Plus, men in Wyoming hoped that, like in a good Western movie, that women would help to civilize the place, that they would build schools and churches, and of course, have children and build the population. In Utah, Mormons hoped that enfranchising women could convince Easterners that Mormon women, despite polygamy, were not downtrodden slaves. Plus, it would help to tip the balance of power in their favor in their ongoing power struggle with non-Mormons, the miners and cowboys and prospectors and railroad construction workers that, roughly, that the locals called hell on wheels who would roll in on the weekends who tended not to have women with them. These Western victories definitely picked up the sagging spirits of the suffragists nationwide, but it also taught them one of the most important lessons about politics that they would ever learn. Politicians might not be won over by arguments for the justice of women's suffrage, but they could be won over if suffragists could show them some reason or reasons that they would benefit from giving women the vote. In other words, 
would, they would continue always with arguments for universal suffrage, but an expediency argument was always going to be necessary for victory. The four victories in the West were important for so many reasons. In the long slog toward a federal amendment, each state was going to be important. Remember that as a state went for woman suffrage, its congressmen and senators would almost certainly support a federal amendment if it came up in Congress, and then the state would almost surely ratify the holding to women voters. The Western victories also made it clear that woman suffrage now had support beyond one region of the country, and that it was no longer only the cause of radicals. In addition, in the 1880s, a lot more people became part of this who were decidedly not radicals. The leader of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Frances Willard, converted to the suffrage cause, bringing with her this huge numbers of conservative Christian women, frustrated that politicians seemed to be listening only to the liquor industry, and women convinced that working for suffrage was not at all radical, but in fact, their Christian duty. With alcohol abuse, a major social problem in the 19th century, women poured into the WCTU, no pun intended, which became the largest women's organization yet in history. It helped that the WCTU had chapters in nearly every American community, as well as in 21 foreign countries. And I might add, um, as in the new volume, there is um, essays by Catherine Marino about the international context of the US suffrage movement. Uh, it is very interesting to note that uh, woman suffrage at this time in the late 1800s was being adopted in other nations. Uh, decades ahead of the United States as a nation. And this included New Zealand and Australia, the first two. And there that the WCTU was also very important in contributing to the victory. So as the end of the 19th century approached, things were looking more promising for the movement for several reasons. And in 1890, the suffrage movement entered a new era. The, what would be the last 30 years, as the leaders put aside the rivalries of the last 20 years and reunited in the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Under the command of Anthony, the movement began to grow in terms of size and influence. Strategists in the movement still had that goal of a federal amendment, but they realized to attain it, they had to have many more state victories and in all parts of the country they had to become a truly national movement. Now, recognizing this, uh, in 1892, Laura Clay, a suffrage leader from Kentucky, crucial intermediary between Northern and Southern suffragists, wrote to the national leader saying, you can work for 50 years and never get anywhere unless you, quote, bring in the South. As I discuss at length in this book, my first book, which may interest you if you want to know more about this very distinctive chapter in the movement's history. In their eagerness to win over states in what was extremely hostile territory, national leaders would cooperate with white Southern suffragists in exploiting the issue of white supremacy. Now, Southern states in the late 19th century were being led increasingly by uh, conservative white men who were uh, elite men, very eager to regain political power. And they very much resented understatement that Congress had enfranchised former slaves, and they insisted that by changing the Constitution, this had been a horrible violation of the rights of states. They said that the states of the former Confederacy had been required to ratify the 14th and 15th Amendment as the price of readmission to the Union. And therefore, as far as they were concerned, these ratifications were illegitimate, done as if in a hostage situation. By 1890, they had succeeded in regaining white political supremacy by means of fraud and violence. But they were eager to find a way to do it, what they would call legally and permanently 
And in the 1890s, they begin meeting, considering adopting changes in state laws that would not mention African Americans specifically, but would effectively keep them from voting. Things we're all familiar with, literacy tests, poll taxes, et cetera. But they feared that Congress or the Supreme Court would punish the states by cutting their representation in Congress as was called for in the 14th Amendment Enforcement Clause. And so the Southern white suffragists, together with the national leaders, devised a Southern strategy. They argued that the South should adopt woman suffrage as a means of preserving white supremacy. Since there were far more white women than African American in the South, they argued enfranchising women would accomplish these men's purpose without risking punishment under the enforcement clause. And in fact, they said it would actually amount to a liberalization of voting laws. You wouldn't be, you would be expanding this franchise and not disfranchising. Moreover, white Southern suffragists and their allies among the national leaders went all over the South promoting this strategy and insisting that if, if necessary, educational or property requirements could be added to ensure that most of the new voters would be white. They even went so far as to hold their national convention in several Southern cities in 1895 in Atlanta. And they asked their aging hero, Frederick Douglass, who had been a welcome guest at suffrage conferences in Washington to stay away. By 1903, however, it was becoming clear that this Southern strategy had failed. The region's politicians, in the words of one Mississippi politician, refused to, quote, cower behind petticoats and use lovely women to maintain white supremacy. And instead, as we know, they found other means to do so that did not involve the destruction of woman's traditional role. And Congress and Supreme Court let them get away with it for half a century more until 1965. This was not only a white women's movement, however. Despite white suffragists' virtual abandonment of black suffrage during this period, in contrast to their earlier support for universal suffrage, and, in, and, and despite this increased discrimination against African-American women, a growing number of black women actively supported women's suffrage, many of them working through African-American women's clubs or suffrage clubs of their own creation. These included Mississippi-born Ida B. Wells Burnett, um, the well-known figure today, who was a newspaper editor in Memphis until exiled to Chicago after her vigorous protest against lynching. She became internationally famous as a crusader against lynching and was one of the founders of the NAACP. She also founded Chicago's Alpha Suffrage Club, through which black women of the city began to exercise considerable influence in city politics well before 1920. Mary Church Terrell, educator and first president of the National Association of Colored Women, born into a wealthy Memphis family. She also to the North, was one of the first African-American women allowed to attend and also to address national conferences. She also addressed the International Woman Suffrage Conference in Berlin and in fluent German. Ella Hunt Logan, a faculty member at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, was one of the, the black women in the South openly support woman suffrage despite the risks. She was not allowed into the Southern white suffrage organizations or at attend their conferences when held in the South, but she was a life member of the NAWSA and wrote articles for its journal and uh, about the NACW suffrage activities. She also wrote pro-suffrage articles in the crisis of, of the newly formed um, NAACP, insisting that if white women needed the vote to protect their rights, then black women who were victims of racism as well as sexism needed the ballot even more. Nevertheless, white suffrage leaders who either shared the nativism or racism endemic to the turn of the century America. 
or who reluctantly concluded that they must cater to it in order for the movement to succeed, succeed continued in their attempts to shed the movement's radical image and to enlarge their constituency among whites. In the first decade of the 20th century, the movement seemed stalled. Anthony had retired, then died a suffrage martyr, never to see the success which she famously said uh, was inevitable. She was briefly succeeded by Carrie Chapman Catt, very talented Iowan who initiated many reforms in the national organization that uh, Sally Hunter Graham has described so well, uh, modernizing its operations, seeking to recruit more club women and wealthy and influential society women like Alva Vanderbilt Belmont, who helped to finance the movement in its last stages, as well as had lots of strong ideas about strategy. Also, new leaders emerged who expanded the national constituency in very different ways, such as Harriet Stanton Blanche, Stanton's daughter, who helped the movement reach out across class lines to working women. And Maud Wood Park, a young college student who heard Anthony speak and then admiring Anthony's dedication, decided to vote herself to the movement and recruited other college women, urging them, as I urge you, to see their opportunities as owed to the women's rights movement. And then there was Rose Schneiderman, the fiery speaker under five feet tall, who uh, was one of the most compelling speakers of the whole movement, who helped to convince other women in industry that the vote would greatly benefit them. However, Kat was president only four years when she had to quit owing to the illness of her husband, would later return near the end of the movement. The woman in charge between 1904 and 1915, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, a great woman, a great orator, a medical doctor, certified minister, was an ineffective leader politically, and there were no victories years. But there was something going on that was going to greatly change American politics and the suffrage movement, a new reform movement sweeping the nation that was to have a major positive impact and contribute much to the suffrage movement's victory. And that was the progressive movement. It would have a, the impact of motivating women to become suffragists, motivating men to support them, and providing what the floundering movement badly needed, a new expediency argument. The progressive movement began around 1900 at the grassroots level. It swept both national parties. We associated, of course, with Republican President Theodore Roosevelt and Democrat Woodrow Wilson. It proved to be a tremendous boon to the suffrage cause. Progressives in both parties supported reform to clean up city and state national politics, introduce mayor council forms of government. In all sections of the US, including the South, the woman's suffrage movement drew support from men and women who supported progressive reforms, including large numbers of women involved in the growing women's club movement. Women very frustrated that using indirect influence didn't seem to count much compared to politicians who were using direct influence, including lots of money. They wanted to vote to enhance their ability to promote reforms. Where food and drug laws, child labor laws, public health programs, improved schools, occupational safety for workers, living, better living conditions in the cities, and legislation to curb political corruption. This cartoon shows corrupt politicians fleeing as Madam enters with her broom. The goals of the progressive movement fit perfectly with the prevailing ideas about woman's nature. Progressives believe that women tended to be more nurturing, compassionate, and honest, and would therefore vote for progressive reforms. In fact, I argue in One Woman, One Vote, then and now, that women eventually won the vote, not because people's ideas about woman's nature had changed, because Americans changed their ideas about the nature and purpose of government, wanting government to be protective 
compassionate, and moral. The last line on this poster says, women are by nature and training housekeepers, the women to vote. They will introduce an occasional spring cleaning. As in the case of temperance and suffrage, however, the idea that women would support progressive reforms provoked opposition and businessmen and politicians who stood to lose from progressive reforms, such as those connected to the cotton textile industry in the South, which relied so heavily on child labor, uh, joined the liquor industry as formidable opponents of women's suffrage and worked together with the growing number of anti-suffrage associations to oppose state suffrage referenda. Around 1912, the movement really took off. Uh, increased support for suffrage resulting from the progressive movement, as well as a new series of victories in the Western states. Washington, 1910, California, 1911, and in 1912, Oregon, Kansas, and Arizona. This seemed to breathe new life into suffragists all over America, who now focused on the harder to crack states like New Jersey and New York, and then the Solid South. The return from England of this young woman, Alice Paul, who had been inspired by the energy and boldness of the so-called militant British suffragist, known as the suffragettes, was also a major factor in the new suffrage activism. As I mentioned, uh, the British suffragists that Paul admired, uh, let me take this opportunity to make a quick point about terminology uh, the use of the word suffragist and suffragette. Most women who worked for the vote in the UK and the US call themselves suffragists. The press began calling them suffragettes in England, a diminutive to belittle them, uh, a favorite uh, in insinuation was that they were spoiled and naive, self-indulgent, running around promoting suffrage instead of taking care of husbands and children. If you don't believe me, look at Mary Poppins. In the UK only, the militants, the followers of Emmeline Pankhurst, embraced the term suffragettes. In the United States, however, that didn't happen, in part because the suffragettes in Britain engaged in tactics and violence and destruction. Suffragists in the US, even the more militant ones, generally avoided the term. So in the US, suffragette was simply an insult that the suffragists disliked and never used for themselves with one group in New York at one point. So on behalf of everybody who studies the suffrage movement, I beseech you, if you don't learn anything else this year, please um, don't continue as so many people do innocently to make that very common mistake. Here you see the program advertising what became one of Paul's first and most dramatic accomplishment, the famous suffrage parade at the time of President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration in 1913, in which thousands of marchers paraded down Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, HBO a few years ago made a feature film on the National Woman's Party uh, that they called Iron Jawed Angels with Hillary Swank as Alice Paul and a great cast. The parade attracted so much attention that when Wilson arrived in Washington, few were there to even meet his train. Wilson was reared in the South. He had a traditional Southern view about a lot of things, including states' rights and white supremacy. And he admired women who remained in the traditional protected role outside of politics. He would be converted only reluctantly to supporting woman suffrage. Unfortunately, this crowd, mostly men, many of them drunk, hostile to the suffragists, attacked the marchers, while the police did nothing. But to Paul's delight, this led to increased sympathy for the movement and to a major congressional investigation, especially since uh, many members of Congress had wives, sisters, and daughters among the marchers and among the injured. Here you see the ambulances trying to reach the marchers. Paul was absolutely terrific at gaining press attention for the movement. Paul's militancy and impatient with the National American Women's Suffrage Association's slow state-by-state -state plotting led to a new schism 
in the suffrage movement. She would split with the NAWSA and form the National Women's Party in 1914. Paul and her followers demanded that the National abandon all state campaigns, focus exclusively on gaining the federal amendment. They also tried some tactics borrowed from British suffragettes that violated the National's nonpartisan policy and infuriated national leaders. This included calling for all women who already had the vote in all those Western states um, to oppose Wilson and all Democrats until Wilson put the full power of his party behind the federal amendment. They also picketed the White House, something decidedly uncommon in those days and certainly shocking to when it was done by women. Many Americans today, especially women's rights supporters, very much admire the militancy of Alice Paul and her followers. Without a doubt, they were very determined, very brave, even though their tactics were extremely controversial and disowned by the moderate and massive National American Women Suffrage Association. The most shocking thing done by the militants was picketing the White House even after the United States entered World War I when criticism of the president and the government was simply not tolerated. But you see here, um, they are trying to embarrass him before the world, a man who claimed to be making the world safe for democracy. Um, and they also, uh, the word, they really shocked people with this sign when they went out one day calling him Kaiser Wilson. The Wilson administration was eventually uh, bailed many of them, gave them long sentences under terrible conditions, Occoquan Workhouse near DC, which at this point during the centennial is being turned into a, a major museum with a statue uh, being built. Some, including Alice Paul, went on a hunger strike. Uh, she was forcibly fed like they had been in Britain with tubes uh, shoved down her nose and a funnel in the tube and raw eggs scrambled up and poured in and led to bleeding and nausea. It's absolutely um, horrible. Uh, this, of course, there were no photographs of that, so we borrowed this from uh, Iron Jawed Angels. Finally, the word leaked out and the outcry from the public forced the Wilson administration to back down and release them, gaining valuable publicity and considerable sympathy for Paul and her supporters, uh, a story that still shocks uh, the nation. But they then had replicas of their prison uniforms made, ordered, uh, if you call it, if that's the right word, a train, got a special train, and went all over the country uh, giving stump speeches everywhere uh, to make sure that everyone knew what had happened to them when they tried to gain the vote. Meanwhile, the NAWSA continued its work, but instead of Anna Howard Shaw, under the very talented and strategic leader, Carrie Chapman Catt. Having returned to the national presidency in 1915, this skillful general of the movement immediately launched her so-called winning plan, coordinating efforts across the nation, working hard to gain Wilson support, and running a massive uh, lobbying effort uh, to enlist congressional support. But like the women shown here, Kat was a confirmed pacifist. When the United States entered World War I, she put aside her own personal beliefs and urged suffragists uh, to support the war effort. The support of suffragists for the war, even the NAWSA actually raised money and, and uh, recruited nurses and had its own field hospital, for example. Um, it enhanced the patriotic image of the movement with the public and powerful decision makers, including Woodrow Wilson. In gratitude for the suffragist war work, plus a growing number of state victories, um, and the conversion of President Wilson eventually led Congress to approve the 19th Amendment and submit it to the states in June 1919. It seems clear to me that Katz's skillful political maneuvering together with Alice Paul's pressure on Wilson uh, and along with other militant suffragists 
that these were all factors in getting the movement uh, to this point. However, it was still not over. After Congress approved the federal amendment, remember, it still had to be ratified by 36 states, which was three-fourths in those days before it could become law. As Paul sewed stars on the suffrage flag one by one as the states ratified, the struggle over ratification began. Illinois and Wisconsin competed for the honor of being the first to ratify, while Georgia and Alabama scrambled to be the first to pass a rejection resolution denouncing the Susan B. Anthony Amendment as, quote, unwarranted, unnecessary, and downright dangerous, unquote. And many Southern state legislatures vowed to fight till the end against this incursion into the rights of states, insisting along with the Southern white anti-suffrage women who put out this, uh, this brochure, that the 19th Amendment was nothing more than an extension of the 15th and that approval of the 19th would signify consent to the 15th, which no true son or daughter of the South could possibly do. Uh, if you look down, there's a detail at the bottom. Men of the South, the 15th Amendment, but sleeps. Here you see a detail of an anti-suffrage poster, a Southern woman speaks her mind. Were you represented suffragette on Flanders Field? Uh, note the ungrateful airhead theme was especially popular among uh, Southern anti-suffragists. All over the nation, Many battles were hard fought with suffragists and anti-suffragists using all the powers of persuasion at their command. But the summer of 1920, only one more state was needed. And yet no further legislative sessions were scheduled before the November 1920 election. Desperate suffragists began pleading for special sessions and national leaders from both parties, now reasonably sure that women would soon be voting did everything they could to make sure that their party didn't emerge as the one that looked like it had, 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 had failed to support it. President Wilson, eager to have a democratically controlled state be the 36th and final state, was able to pressure the reluctant governor of Tennessee to call such a session. You see here Governor Roberts with suffrage leaders. And thus, the final battle over women's suffrage took place in Nashville in the long, hot summer of 1920. In that final dramatic contest, anti-suffragists as well as suffragists from all over the nation descended upon the state in a bitter suffrage struggle over ideology and influence. Notwithstanding the recently enacted prohibition amendment, the hermitage was said to be awash with the free liquor allegedly distributed by the whiskey interest. Indeed, according to the suffragists, many interest groups were active, using influence that was sometimes more persuasive than the indirect influence, which was still the only method available to the suffragists. So despite the glare of national publicity, suffragists watched with dismay as men pledged to support ratification mysteriously switched sides, and they were quite uncertain of the result when the vote took place on August the 18th, 1920. But finally, Tennessee ratified the result of one 24-year-old legislator from the mountains, one Harry Byrne, changing his vote at the insistence of his elderly mother. Amazing but true, the ante still managed to delay official ratification through parliamentary tricks. Um, quickly calling for a revote um, and therefore throwing our whole nation into confusion this past August when nobody knew whether to celebrate on the 18th or the 26th. Some in the national media, of course, regarded this as quite unchivalrous and ridiculed the South for doing this while anti-suffrage legislators fled the state on the train in order to prevent a quorum from being called. Their associates then held massive anti-suffrage rallies and otherwise attempted uh, through bribes, et cetera, to convince the, these pro-suffrage legislators to change their positions. Finally, 
during that week, Tennessee reaffirmed its vote, the governor signed, they rushed the document to Washington, and the Secretary of State certified it in the dead of night before the antis could get an injunction or otherwise interfere at the very end. As suffragists celebrated, the 19th Amendment was finally officially added to the United States Constitution on August 26, 1920, the date we now celebrate as Women's Equality Day. The Woman's Hour had finally arrived. If I might plug another author's terrific book, Elaine Weiss has told the story with great suspense and excitement. Uh, her book, The Woman's Hour, uh, in which she tells the story about this final battle in Tennessee with color and suspense, uh, to the point that when Hillary Clinton read it, she picked up her phone, called her pal, Steven Spielberg, and uh, he is going to be making a movie uh, out of it, and all of us are, are green with envy of Elaine. In conclusion, the suffrage struggle was long and arduous. It is no wonder that suffragists felt exhausted as well as elated upon realizing their victory. This is the famous suffrage cartoonist, Nita Allender's famous victory cartoon entitled, Every Good Suffragist, The Morning After the Victory. The movement exhausted several generations of leaders who devised and revised strategies and tactics to fit the changing times. As I mentioned at the outset, winning state victories and getting two thirds of each House of Congress to approve a federal amendment and then three fourths of the states to ratify was not easy. And it was all not always pretty or noble in terms of the methods used on either side. It was a hard fought battle with opposition every step of the way. One of the main takeaways of this story is that the vote was not given to women in 1920. They fought for it. And it took 72 years before they finally succeeded. Also, it's important to realize that in 1920, they almost didn't succeed. Had Harry Byrne not changed his vote, had Tennessee not ratified, the 19th Amendment would not have been approved before the 1920 election. And all of you who are students of history and politics are probably aware, after 1920, the United States entered a period of reaction. Elected conservative presidents recoiled from progressive reform. It is highly likely that the federal government would have, uh, the federal amendment would not have made it during the 1920s. Hmm. It is possible that like some European countries, including France, American women, at least not all of them, would not have been able to vote until after World War II in those states that refused to enfranchise women on their own. The other point to leave you with is that not all women, even all American women who were citizens, were allowed to actually use that newly acquired right. Though African American women outside the South voted and turned out in large numbers, um, and that they turned out in large numbers in the South to register and attempt to vote. But most African American women were living in the South in 1920, and they were prevented from voting, as many predicted and expected, by the same barriers erected against Black men between the 1890s and 1903. A major goal then of the civil rights movement of the 1960s was to remove those barriers. And again, many women like the incredible Fannie Lou Hamer fought along with men at great risk to their lives in order to do so. It was a goal largely accomplished through the Voting Rights Act of 1965, bill super important, which sent federal marshals to oversee elections in states, mostly Southern states, that had allowed only a tiny portion of eligible black voters to register and vote. And in effect, this act enforced both the 15th and the 19th Amendment fully for the very first time. I must say that when the Supreme Court ruled in 2013, the most 
crucial part of its Shelby County versus Holder decision. Um, and, and it did away with what we call the pre-clearance clause that would require any state that was contemplating uh, changing some election qualifications to clear it ahead of time with the Justice Department. A terrible decision. They were assuming that in the age of Obama that keeping states from discriminating against minority voters was no longer needed, but they made a big mistake and almost immediately voter suppression became a huge problem in American elections. We took a great step backward. And what that means is that the suffrage movement is never over. Suffrage is a right not only hard to acquire, but alas, hard to keep. In my humble opinion, a movement to guarantee the voting rights of every citizen of the United States is needed once again allowing all citizens to take advantage of the rights bestowed by the Constitution through the 15th and 19th Amendment, later extended by the 26th Amendment to young people between 18 and 21. Still, the adoption of the 19th Amendment was a major breakthrough in franchising most women and giving the rest a right that they continued to fight for and in the 1960s were able to claim which meant that 100 years after the Civil War and the 15th Amendment, the original goal of the suffragists, universal suffrage regardless of race or sex, was realized for the first time, though we must continue to regain and defend it. So each time that there's an election, from tiny local ones to the big, hugely important presidential ones like the one looming ahead, Please remember that voting is a right won at great cost and get out there and use it. Especially in 2020, the centennial of the 19th Amendment and a year in which there is a hugely important presidential election, a big turnout as well as a big celebration is warranted, honoring the achievement of all these women who clearly believed that voting was a right worth great sacrifice. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, are you going to get up there? Yes. Oh, we're going to go. No, the, the mic's not on, is it? Okay. <laughs> 
If, could they not hear me at all, Ty Tyron? I'm going to try to bring you up. It seemed so easy when Owen was doing it. Catherine, we may have to have you up here. I, I've, I'm trying to, I'm trying to unmute and ask to start for you. Aaron? Yeah. Marjorie, you should be up too. Hello? It's Tyron, okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, so I really like the lecture. I've never heard anything about the US suffrage movement before. I'm much more familiar with the UK one. And I wanted to ask on those lines, could you expand upon the differences and similarities between the different suffrage movements at this time? Uh, my initial impression is that the American version was far less violent than the British one. Um, yeah, I'll just be really interested to hear what you think, given that it seems several countries after World War I kind of gained women's suffrage roughly at the same time. Yeah. Um, the, the similarities are really interesting, and that whole national, international story is so fascinating. Um, it, it appears that what happened is former British colonies uh, now independent countries uh, led the way. Uh, as I mentioned, WCTU had a lot to do with that uh, in some cases. Um, New Zealand and Australia were early. Canada was early. Um, South Africa and Kenya were early. And then also in the um, Scandinavian countries, um, they also preceded Britain and the United States. Um, socialist feminist in Europe had a lot to do with it in uh, Scandinavia. Um, and it's one also th thing that's also super interesting, I believe, is that um, whereas in the United States, um, all women citizens were enfranchised, though as we know, a lot of them were not allowed then to use it by cause of state action but they were all enfranchised with rights that later built upon, uh, demanded be enforced. But that wasn't the case in all of these early countries that preceded us. Um, in um, New Zealand, it was the case, and including the Maori women were enfranchised. But in Australia, um, the indigenous people were not enfranchised. And in Canada, um, native, First Americans, or first Canadians, excuse me, were not uh, enfranchised. And then in England, of course, uh, young women initially were not uh, given the vote, had to wait 10 more years um, before it was changed to include everyone. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a movement that's sweeping the world, um, but showing particularly the you know, Western democracies, of course, people didn't have the vote in every part of the world, men or women. Um, but it was all, um, they were all aware of each other. And um, of course, in Britain, the movement starts in the mid 19th century. Um, the Seneca Falls Convention was considered by them to be a, uh, an important development. Um, there was a transnational, um, international woman suffrage organization that was founded largely by Anthony and Stanton in the 1880s. And um, Millicent Fawcett, who was, of course, the major leader of the British uh, suffrage movement, although in this country, hardly anyone has ever heard of her. Uh, they only have heard of Emmeline Pankhurst, who was, of course, the very flamboyant, brave leader of, of the group that embraced the term suffragettes. You may not know it, but uh, Emmeline Pankhurst came to the United States uh, on speaking to her, and so did her daughters. And there was one amazing case where she came in um, during Wilson's administration, and they stopped her at uh, Ellis Island and wouldn't allow her to enter the country, which was until you know all kinds of protests erupted, and and then she was able to come. The, so the stories about the connections between the, the movements are, are really quite fascinating. <laughs> Great to thank you. Uh, now we're going to have the generous 
uh, endowers of our of our of this lecture series, uh, Linda McLean and and or Jim Fleming. I'm, it, it says Jim Fleming, but I believe it's Linda McLean. The question for me. But. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Professor Spruill. It's good to see you uh, on the screen there, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, so my question goes back to your example of the uh, Pioneer uh, Women's Monument, because I we organized a conference at Boston University School of Law, which is going to be held a week from tomorrow. So some of these quotes and things I'm familiar with, and I, I actually wrote a little bit about that monument myself. So here's, here's what interested me. Um, the and it goes to kind of the question of the politics of monuments. As you, as you, I'm sure you know, the initial plan was just to have Stanton and Anthony sitting at a table together with a scroll with about quotes from 20 different suffragists, including either 11 or 13 women of color. But people didn't like the scroll, and they also didn't like the exclusion of other people. So they finally settled on adding Sojourner Truth giving her a literal place at the table. But she's an icon, right? But as you point out, there's so many other black women who were central to the movement. So I guess my question to you is, you know, on this an anniversary of the 100th anniversary, uh, this occasion of the 100th anniversary, how do you think people should try to remember the 19th Amendment and to, to have a, a, not just a warts and all appreciation as you've suggested with the nativism and all that, but also a richer understanding of all these different people that were involved in the effort. Yeah, I, I think both. We need to understand the warts and all. And we also not need to understand that this was a movement that so many people of so many backgrounds uh, contributed to. And, that, uh, and, and I think that I've been just very heartened to see that in this 2020 celebration, um, that there's been a tremendous uh, amount of outpouring of, of books and articles, films, documentaries, and uh, lots more attention uh, that, to the work of people other than a handful of the um, most famous white suffragists. Uh, do you I feel like that, that there's been a um, major step forward? Yeah, and I just want to show a little puzzle to everybody. Here's a votes for women puzzle, which actually puts Anthony and Stanton at the bottom. <laughs> you know, it's got totally different people featured. So there are many ways uh, to, to bring attention to, to all these other aspects of the history. And I, I really appreciate your lecture for uh, trying to make an effort to make people aware, even of all the different phases of the struggle, including the hunger strikes and everything else toward the very end. It, it, it's just incredibly complex and, and interesting and just so many angles and every part of the country is different and, and it happened. But, you know, what I was trying to do in this is to, um, is to look at how, we, how it came to focus on a, 19, on a constitutional amendment, why it didn't go another route. And, and in regard to um, the young man's question that we were just discussing, that the United States was also very different from all these other countries in that it had all these states. It didn't have the luxury of only seeking the, the, a decision from the parliament or, you know, the, the one legislative elected body. And because of that decision in 1874, they had to fight it out in almost 50 states, as well as at the national level. So Carrie Chapman Catt in 1920, uh, or when she and uh, Natalie Schuler were publishing their book, Politics of Women's Suffrage in 1923, she um, looked at it from an international perspective um, and was bitter and somewhat angry that uh, she said, the woman suffrage movement in the land of its birth, meaning Seneca Falls Convention, had had to fight longer, um, win more contests, expend more energy, waste more lives, et cetera, et cetera, um, all in order to wring woman suffrage out of resentful and hostile group of men. And, and so it's, it's kind of interesting. One of the reasons that we 
have not had a woman president in this country is that we have a more complicated, divided kind of government. And in the case of suffrage, I think it's important for us to understand just how hard it was to get it uh, because not only of the constitutional barriers, but because of the fact that um, we have such a divided form of government. Does anyone here want anyone in his, we have a small audience here, just a, oh, it's a very large audience actually, uh, the distance. Uh, does anyone, anyone have a question here? All right, Ian, then I'm gonna make you come up here. Hi, thank you so much for your talk again, first of all. Um, and I had a question regarding the uh, relation between the 17th Amendment and the 18th Amendment because they were ratified so close to each other in a, in a temporal sense, but why, and that the uh, um, uh, move against liquor and, and the prohibi prohibition era was almost, in, in your talk, it seemed to me that it was tied to the women's suffrage movement. Um, why was that amendment ratified? Well, I think it was almost like eight or nine or 10 months before, but it took longer for the um, eight, 19th Amendment to get forward. Sorry, about 18th Amendment and 19th Amendment, sorry. Mm -hmm. I didn't think you were talking about the income tax. <laughs> I think that's the 17th. Right? Um, so you're asking about the relationship between the Prohibition Amendment and the Women's Suffrage Amendment. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Um, I had somebody ask me one time, since um, um, Prohibition had already gone through in, you know, before women's suffrage, why did the liquor industry still fight so hard in 1920? And you're going, excuse me, do you think that they were going to give up? You know, I mean, they, they were not about to, to say, oh, shoot, we lost and, there, and there's prohibition. I mean, the, before it even went into effect, they were already fighting to get it repealed. Um, and so they, and they fought with I mean, it, it was an existential struggle for them, and they fought it with everything they had. Um, so back in the 1880s, when the Women's Christian Temperance Union came out um, for women's suffrage, as I said, it was a key step in, in giving the women's suffrage movement that constituency that it needed that was nationwide and seen as more mainstream and not radical. Absolutely key to that. But as Kat pointed out, it also gave the woman suffrage movement its most vicious and powerful enemy and one that had such tremendous financial resources to use in the struggle and uh, was very shady about it and, and kept it a secret. Um, I have read in some of the new material that's been written um, about the women's movement in the West, which is just fascinating, um, that on the West Coast, according to one scholar, they did not succeed until they kind of separated the women's suffrage movement a, a, a bit from the uh, temperance movement because it was hurting them so much everywhere. So it's a, you know, in other words, it helped in some places, it hurt in some places, it, it depends on, you know, what you were looking at. But certainly overall, um, the, I believe that the support of the WCTU was a key factor in, in it being um, adopted. It's, um, when you look at the southern states, um, nine of the 10 states that refused to ratify were south of the Mason-Dixon line. So, I mean, there's no overestimating the problems for the movement that were caused there. And yet, um, so, and so much of the argument against women's suffrage, particularly the federal amendment, was stated in the form of devotion of the Southern states to states' rights and not wanting federal uh, oversight and all this. And yet, where did the Prohibition Amendment get its most enthusiastic and ready support from the Southern states? And so the, the Southern suffragists uh, never tired of pointing out the hypocrisy um, of those Southern states rushing 
to adopt prohibition and then insisting that, oh, no, no, we could never support the federal suffrage amendment because of our commitment to states' rights. So it's, it's a complicated and interesting story. I think I have two more questions. Uh, if the people are, if the people are there, uh, Paul Tatum, are you there? Tried to call you up, but if you're no, oh. well, um, thank you for a lovely um, a lovely talk. And I'm in Tucson, Arizona, at the moment, not far from the Mexico border, and I was just noticing it, it looks like Mexico women gained the right to vote in 1953. And I was curious if the US um, uh, movements had any connections uh, with Mexico, and if you knew any about that, that, that area or collaboration. Um, it, interesting though, I'm a big fan of Mexico and have traveled there quite a lot and heard a lot about its history. I don't know a lot about the, about the Mexican woman. There's a lot of feedback here. Okay. Um, so when I was saying that I love Mexico, traveled there a lot, know a lot about its history, but I don't, curiously enough, haven't read much about the suffrage movement there, but what I do know is more widespread about Latin America. Um, and that is that uh, it's a very interesting uh, story that again, I would recommend a book by Catherine Marino of uh, UCLA uh, about this. Um, after 1920, the, the two movements, the two wings of the American suffrage movement the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which transformed itself into the National League of Women Voters, and the National Woman's Party, which continued to exist under the same name, National Woman's Party, both of them became interested in promoting woman suffrage abroad. And they, uh, meanwhile, uh, and, and they both tried to become involved in Europe but they were still fighting with each other, unfortunately, uh, even as they tried to engage with uh, suffrage advocates in other countries. Uh, in, but in Europe, a lot of the countries had gotten the vote, and so the focus was more on uh, what's next and how best to promote women's rights. But in Latin America, there were no Latin American countries that had gotten uh, woman suffrage before we did. And so um, the United States was suffragists were very interested, both branches, uh, in promoting um, woman suffrage there. And they even formed organizations. And um, finally, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt uh, had gone down there. She had become actually the president, the, the founder of the International Woman Suffrage Association back in 1904. And then for the rest of her life, career until around 1924 or so, she continued to be the international president. So she spent time, she did a round the world tour in 1911. Um, she helped people in the Philippines, for example, get it. And she uh, had close associations with uh, women in uh, Brazil. But it was Doris Stevens of the National Women's Party that seemed to have the uh, most success in terms of getting uh, pan-American organizations to take a stand in, in favor of women's rights. So there's some fascinating stories there, and I regret I can't tell you about Mexico. I'm gonna look that up though. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and uh, actually a couple of people have asked this, the same one, so I'm going to try to call up uh, Stephen Mudrick. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, and you, uh, you can start your video too if you want. Okay. Yeah, Here you go. Go ahead. Hold on. Hold on a second. Uh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> Video. There you go. All right. Um, my question was about what does all this have to say? Can it tell this 
tell us anything about the Equal Rights Amendment possibly ever passing and what kind of insight this might lead to that. Yeah, the, the ERA, do, do you know that it was first introduced in 1923? It was, uh, so it was directly came out of the suffrage movement. Um, in as soon as the victory was realized, the National Women's Party had a meeting in 1921 to hear from people from all over the country and decide what their purpose was going to be. And they decided that since the uh, 19th Amendment had enfranchised women, but left totally unchanged all the other laws in terms of inheritance and guardianship and education and all of these things that discriminated against women were still on the state and federal books. And so they decided that the best, and they did uh, major surveys of, of laws all over the country, identifying all these. And they decided that the fastest way to address this would be to have a blanket bill that would basically remove sex as a legal category and, and not allow governments to make laws that apply differently to men and to women. Then that, that would automatically make unconstitutional all of these discriminatory laws. But at the same time, most of the, they, they, that turned out to be a real minority opinion among former suffragists in the 1920s and an extremely unpopular opinion among women's rights advocates in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. And the reason was that during the progressive era, one of the main goals of the progressives was to protect workers. And the fight, the pushback from corporations was immense, would not I allow the idea that the government should interfere between a worker and an employer, things we've heard a lot. Um, and so uh, there was actually a big Supreme Court decision, uh, Mueller versus Oregon, in which the uh, protective legislation for, uh, men, uh, for women was upheld on the basis of the fact that they were the mothers of future citizens and therefore the government had an interest in their health. And so this, most of these reformers would have liked to have had protective legislation for both men and women, but they were only able to get it for women because of that, because of the differences in the sexes and the fact that women bore children. And so in 1923, uh, when the, the idea, they felt like that if the Equal Rights Amendment was adopted, that they would lose every bit of that protective legislation that they had gotten um, that was helping women, particularly women in factories and textile industry, women who were being required to work 12 hours, uh, low pay. There were lots of laws that were helping those women that they felt would be lost. And so it was uh, very, very controversial right from the beginning, but in an entirely different way then the ERA became controversial after 1972. And what happened between 1923 and 1970 was that gradually there were a number of laws during the New Deal and during the 60s that established uh, protective legislation for both sexes. And so by 1970, most of these reformers who opposed it because of their worries about protective legislation being struck down, um, no longer had reason to oppose it. And a lot of those had been people involved in the labor movement. And so um, in 1966, when the National Organization for Women was formed and they decided to take up the ERA as one of their goals, a lot of the labor people thought, oh my God, I'm gonna to have to quit this organization if you do this. While the National Women's Party, who were still around, who were very elderly and very few in number, were just absolutely thrilled to see this new um, energized 
organization take up their old and what had been a very unpopular goal. And so it all came together uh, very quickly. The labor dropped its opposition and uh, these so-called social feminists such as earlier Eleanor Roosevelt had opposed it for that reason. A lot of them came together. And so finally by 1970, you have feminists of all types from the National Women's Party to the League of Women Voters to the AAEW to the BPW, everybody in between plus labor organizations were all behind the Equal Rights Amendment. And because the Republican Party had been kind of supporting it all along, because they didn't like protective legislation, and now the Democratic Party had dropped its objection, in 1972, you get it passed with overwhelming bipartisan support. So both parties are supporting it, all brands of feminism, and then what? Suddenly, the conservative women uh, organize, and, in, and their opposition is, is very different. It's about how to protect the family. And so it becomes a fight of a whole different nature. And yet I think that that history of how it's connected to the suffrage movement, it's an outgrowth of it. They even named it in 1923, the Lucretia Mott Amendment in her honor. And they spoke of it very directly as, as the unfinished work of the suffragist that needed to be carried on. Um, but yet, you know, men, most of the former suffragists opposed it with good reason until uh, those reasons were gone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank, well, thank you. Uh, we've, been, we've been now been here for uh, more than two hours and Marjorie's been on Zoom uh, for two hours, and if, uh, some of us have been on Zoom well, quite a bit longer than that. Uh, so I think we'll probably wrap it up there, but I can't think of a more appropriate thing to have uh, talk to have had on Constitution Day this particular year. Um, that's something we'll, have, we'll get this recording up, and this will actually be a resource. Uh, this, will, this, will, this, will, this whole thing will be a resource to use over and over again, I'm sure. Uh, so let's thank Marjorie Spruill uh, for that great talk. And uh, uh, Jim Fleming and Linda McLean for the spon for sponsoring the lecture, and uh, all of you for coming, and all of you for listening in. Um, uh, let's uh, say good night and turn the recording off. But uh, I believe that this. So let's turn the recording off. So bye bye.